Hello and welcome. Welcome to the Hudson Library and Historical Society. Um, welcome to our Winter Spring Entrepreneurship and Small Business Series. If you've not been here before, um, we have a full calendar of entrepreneurship and small business programs. This is part of our MBA Light Series where we bring in um, educators and professors from the area um, and present on topics of interest. I'm very pleased to welcome Robert Chalfant. He has held management positions in Fortune 10 multinationals, foreign-owned companies, LLCs, internet companies, and startups. In addition to running his own company, he's the director of the Fitzgerald Institute for Entrepreneurial Studies at the University of Akron, where he teaches graduate and undergraduate students in entrepreneurship. He's studied lean launchpad techniques under Steve Blank, the founder, um, at Stanford University and completed the Kauffman Foundation Fast Track Facilitator program along with courses in quality matters and designing your own online classroom. Um, afterwards, I will be distributing during the question and answer, as usual, our um, evaluations, if you would help me out and fill those out so we know how we're, how we're doing. Um, and I'd like to welcome Robert. Thank you. Thank you, Polly. Polly said, my name is Bob Chalfant. Uh, I'm the director of the Fitzgerald Institute for Entrepreneurial Studies at the University of Akron, where I also teach the entrepreneurship courses. I'm also a director of the Entrepreneurship Education Consortium, a group of 11 universities here in Northeast Ohio to get together to find ways to improve entrepreneurial education. I studied the Lean Launchpad process under Steve Blank at Stanford University. I'm taught Lean Launchpad techniques in my courses for two years now. Lean Launchpad is a scientific method for improving the likelihood of success in building a startup. <clears throat> Another thing I can say about it is that it's not easy. But it's less expensive than if you just plow ahead and try to do a startup without laying the groundwork in advance. We try to improve the likelihood of success so you don't waste your, your grandmother's money and your dad's money and your brother's money and all that other money. So entrepreneurship is the management discipline that deals with situations of extreme uncertainty. A startup is extremely uncertain. You never have enough data to make an informed decision. So you take the data you have and move forward. The entrepreneurial mindset can be used by companies of all sizes to pursue continuous innovation. And companies can build an entrepreneurial culture, but only if they change their processes and systems of accountability. Keep in mind that the executives of these large companies got to where they are by following the old rules. Now in, an, in a time when everything is faster, product design cycles are faster, product life cycles are shorter, the old ways tend to move on down the wrong path or move in the right path too slowly. So what is Lean Launchpad? Why does Lean Launchpad even exist? And better, why should you use it? Everyone who's been an entrepreneur was told to write a business plan. Software was written to hold the entrepreneur's hand as he fills in every pre-assigned chapter. If you do an internet search, you can find thousands of business plan models. They're just all over the place. Um, that's been the traditional approach. Uh, and honestly speaking, a business plan is still an important element of your startup. It's just not the first element. And that's what people tell you. You know, you got to write a business plan. Well, the fact is, you don't know how to execute, and a business plan is about execution. Lean Launchpad is founded on the premise that you don't actually know what your customer really wants. You think you do, you have a hypothesis that you think you might be ready to execute, but the fact is, all you have is a hypothesis. Like all scientific methods, you have to research and prove or disprove that hypothesis. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen companies come to me or individuals come to me and say, I want to do this. And I said, well, who's going to buy it? Well, people 18 to 30. And we'll talk about that later on. Um, so you start the search, the search for actual data and knowledge to create a new, unique, innovative model of your business that you can follow that leads to launching and growing your business. Search is the important part. First rule is that startups 
are not smaller versions of large companies. And you've seen in the business plan, oh yeah, who's your CFO? Well, you probably don't, can't afford a CFO as a startup. Who's your chief marketing officer? Who's your chief whatever officer? Fact is, those are really hard to hire and you don't need them yet because you don't know what you're going to execute. When I first got out of college, I worked for a Fortune 10 multinational co corporation. This company had everything. Every conceivable kind of division, every conceivable kind of function inside of it. Startups can't do that. You can't afford it. And you really don't know it. You don't need it yet. You're still searching while the established company is executing a known, proven, well-accepted model in a market that has been proven over several years. That's how a big company is different from a startup. The job of the startup is to search for unknown business models, exploring, testing, and refining a way to innovate that can disrupt or bypass existing businesses. For example, how many of you own a digital picture frame? Okay, how many of you still use a digital picture frame? Exactly, iPads have made digital picture frames obsolete. Sears owned the catalog business. They owned that business. And what is Amazon except an online catalog? I want to know, why isn't Sears Amazon? They could have been. What does Western Union do primarily? They transfer money. Money transfers to foreign countries. Why isn't Western Union PayPal? But Western Union has a long history of avoiding new technologies. When Alexander Graham Bell tried to sell the telephone patent to Western Union for $100,000, they didn't see the business model in a telephone. And it wasn't long after that when telephones were everywhere. And Western Union got beat up again. And of course, why isn't Blockbuster Netflix? Because they had bricks and mortar that they had bought and paid for and had to pay down. They couldn't switch to the online model because they had all this inertia with their old business model. Kodak decided that 25-year-old Kodak employee Steve Sasson's new invention posed too much of a threat to its existing film and paper business. Is it conceivable that Kodak could be the same size as Apple, Microsoft, or even Google today? So it's not impossible to disrupt large established corporations. You gotta find a business model. So what's a startup? First of all, it's a temporary organization. A startup is just what you are until you can start executing. We're a temporary construct that we created. We're doing what we think we need to do to prove our business idea, to demonstrate that our business idea can get some traction in the marketplace, and we're looking for a way to prove it, or more likely, disprove it. And that happens most of the time. In teaching Lean Launchpad over the past two years, I've had my students come up, their, their first assignment in my course is to write down five business ideas. And then the second assignment is to pick your favorite one and we'll publicize it to the rest of the class and you can recruit a team to work on your business idea. And we get, you know, eight or 10 teams based on one of the students' business ideas. Now, most of these kids are undergrads and they're still thinking small ball. They wanna start a restaurant or they wanna, you know, do something small. They don't know how to do it. But I'm not going to be the one to tell them that. Not like that professor at Stanford who gave a D to on the business plan for the guy who founded Federal Express. No exaggeration. He, he, that, was his, that was his final. And he says he's going to build a, a Federal Express, an air, air delivery service. The professor gave him a D. That's not my job. I don't evaluate the business ideas. I tell them, you have to go out and talk to the people you think are gonna be your customers. Let them tell you what they want to do. Just because you wanna do it doesn't mean they have to, they have to buy it. So, Steve, <laughs> as Steve Blank is fond of saying, there is no intelligence in your office. We have to get out of our office, we have to go talk to the people that we think are our customers, we have to talk to the people who are already in that marketplace as customers or as competitors or as suppliers. All those people have market intelligence that you need. And so you gotta get out and talk to those people face to face. 
And no, a Qualtrics survey isn't going to be good enough. Now, having said that, one of the assignments in my courses is for the students to write a Qualtrics survey. And then I go in and critique the questions. The questions have to be designed to extract knowledge, not to give the people that you're trying to interview a known, expected, desired answer. Do you like this idea? And they'll look you in the eye and say, uh, yeah, yeah, I like the idea. Because they're going to tell you what, you what they think you want to hear. And so we have to look at the, the way the questions are written. And after the Qualtrics survey, then they write down the kinds of questions they want to ask face to face with the people. We have to search for ways to reach that customer that can do a better job than what our competitor is doing today. We just have to get out and find ways where the customer is dissatisfied with the competition. We have to find a way that we're, we can repeat that business over and over. We don't want just one customer, we want several. So we want to scale the business. We want to be able to grow the business. How do we, how do we set up an infrastructure that once we start getting customers in a big way, we can still keep on growing. We want to be efficient so that the next customer acquisition cost is less than the co uh, acquisition cost of the last customer. Now, we had long discussions about acquisition costs in class just the other day. Why would, when you're walking through Cleveland Hopkins, there's a table there and one of the airlines wants to give, wants to give you an affinity credit card? And they're willing to give you enough points on that credit card that you can get a free flight. What does that cost? I don't know, 350, 500, 600 dollars. I don't know what it is. But why would they be willing to spend three to 500 dollars to acquire you as a customer? Because over the life of that card, you're going to spend 10, 20, 100 times that. That's why the lifetime cost of a customer uh, just has to be able to offset the acquisition cost. So, follow the curve down. Our business model describes the customer, how we reach the customer, how the customer reaches us. What's the next? No. How the customer reaches us, what value we deliver to our specific, well-defined customer segment. And your customer segment is never everyone who fill in the blank. The BMW sales guy says, my target customer is everybody with a driver's license. Sorry, there are people out there who will never drive a BMW. So everybody with a driver's license is not a valid market segment. And we spend a lot of time talking about how to define your market segment. Uh, how we get, keep, and grow a customer base. And we'll talk about all that. How and how much. How and how much we charge for the service. How do we charge for it? Is it going to be a subscription model? Is it going to be a one-time transaction? Is it going to be freemium? Is it going to be the razors and the blades model? There are so many revenue models. Once you decide on the revenue model, then you can work on the pricing model. And for God's sake, don't get into price war. If you want to start a new market, get something that's better than the old competition so you can charge more. If you come in and reduce your prices, the first thing, you're going to start a price war with people who are well-developed, have established supply chains, have established brand names, and can beat you every time. So don't start a price war. Come in at a high price. If you need to reduce it, you can reduce it. Um, what we need to do really well in order to succeed. And find the things that we can't do well. Who or what organizations are going to help us? Uh, what resources we need to get access to, uh, to in order to pull this whole thing off, and of course, how much does it cost as opposed to the price? How much does it cost so you can determine how much profit there is? So one of the main reasons startups fail is they jump right into execution, and their business idea hasn't been vetted, proven, or at least tested. They haven't gone out and talked to anyone. No one has told them that, you know, I wish you had done this. Satellite phones had this problem. Satellite phones were going to be the next communication device all over the world. People on Mount Everest could use a telephone. And so they threw a bunch of specs over the wall, and the engineers worked on it, worked on it, worked on it for years. And in the meantime, 
The cell phone industry kept building towers, kept building out their network, kept coming up with new features and smaller phones, and when the satellite phones finally hit the market, they were just irrelevant. I don't know, 10 people, 100 people might use them. There might be a need for a satellite phone, but by and large, people get by with cell phones. That's why we don't all carry a satellite phone with us. They tested the market, but they took too long to develop it. You want to, and a lot of times when, when these startup companies begin execution right away, they're just trying to test the depth of the water with both feet. Well, what could go wrong with that? Uh, you ju they just can't imagine that somebody doesn't want their product. Probably a long time ago, somebody told them, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. I remember that phrase as a child. I thought, great, I'm going to invent something. I'm just going to set it out on the curb and people will buy it. Boy, that lie has perpetrated more business failures than anybody in this room can count. So don't do that. The new tools that, startup need, that startups need will highlight the critical factors listed above, listed earlier, that need to be explored, tested, refined, reevaluated, and proven. So, the question is, can we build a process to search for all those elements before we commit huge sums of money to chasing a pipe dream? There's a lot of ac uh, academic research. We've all read uh, uh, Moore's Crossing the Chasm. It's used as, as an example from every, every business idea that ever comes down the pike. We've all read Christensen's Innovator's Dilemma and all the books that came after that. So there's a lot of academic work that proves that customer discovery is something important. How does an innovator inno innovate? How does he go forward with it? In this case, we want to do customer discovery, discover who that customer is. If we think that uh, men 18 to 30 are our target market, go out and find those guys. Ask them if they have a problem that your, your product can solve. So, now we're just going to, uh, there's also in the company development phase, there's other academic work that's been done to show that, yeah, we can take what's done in the customer discovery and customer validation box, move it into a real company. So let's start with the customer development process. In fact, that's all we'll be talking about tonight. I'm not going to go into creating your company. We have an idea for a new kind of car that we think the customer wants. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> We have an idea of a new kind of car that we think the customer wants. It's an inexpensive, very efficient start car. So we get, out, get to talk to people who drive inexpensive, efficient cars. We do the right kind of questioning. We translate their needs, comments, suggestions, and preferences, and come out with what we think is what the customer wants. Hang out at the dealership, talk to the customers, talk to the, the, the salespeople. Finally figure out, you know, what I need is one of these. Well, you're kind of smiling, but the fact is, these cars are selling. Somebody went out, talked to the kinds of people who felt that this is the car that they need. They re relied on dividing the market. There are people who will never get into a smart car. And there are people who think that it's the, the salvation of planet Earth. So you can't please everybody, and this is a perfect example of it. You're going to find a customer segment that you can serve better than anybody else. So they looked at all the things that they needed to, to be in this car, and just as importantly, all the things that did not need to be in this car. And this is what they get. And they're selling like crazy in Europe. <laughs> See, there's a market. There's a market. So how do we document all this re research? What is the Lean Launchpad? It's a method. Lean Launchpad is a method. Everybody thinks that it's this business model canvas that we have on the wall here and that you have as a handout. That's just a tool in the Lean Launchpad. Lean Launchpad is a method to help startup te teams fail less, in, fail less in turning their ideas into companies. It's process-driven. 
It's evidence-based, and it uses a scientific approach just like a scientist would use to prove a scientific hypothesis. Our hypothesis is we need a small, fuel-efficient car. We need, well, as Google told us today, they did tell us, you need a watch. That watch is going to cost $10,000 if you get the gold-plated version. They have a gold-plated iWatch, or they will in a month anyway. So, we've learned from Apple what we need. So, get out of your office, go talk to people. The method is teachable, it's learnable, and it's focused on learning the entrepreneurial process. It doesn't rely on a demo day. There's no deadline, typically, on the Lean Launchpad process. You're going to do it for as long as it takes. You're going to go out and research. You're going to come back, compare notes with the rest of your team, and all the team, has, all the team members have to go out and talk to customers. And you're going to have a form that talks about what the demographics and psychographics of that customer is so that you know who you're talking to. Um, process doesn't have a schedule. We all recognize sooner is better, of course, but it usually does not end in a demo day, such as the first day of a trade show. How many people in here have been working, have worked for a company, and you had to do a product development, and doggone it has to be ready for the trade show? Boy, howdy. I got to tell you, that was an artificial deadline that everybody had to meet. This is not that. Of course, that was typically for companies that were well established, except for a couple that I was in. Um, again, there's no intelligence inside your office. You have to get out and talk to people. The process challenges teams to create their own business models. The business model includes all nine elements of the business, uh, business model canvas, uh, and the process especially values revision and continual improvement of their hypotheses. Again, you think that somebody needs this product. The approach emphasizes experiential learning. You can't make it up. And I got to tell you, the students that have written their, their business model canvases is, we think this. Uh, we hope this. We believe in this. I don't care what they hope, think, or believe. This is not a faith-based initiative. This is a scientific method to go out and find out what people want. Now, the questions have to be careful. Henry Ford is famous for having said, if I had asked my customers what they wanted, they would have said a faster horse. You have to tease out the, the interesting things that you, that you want to know. Um, it relies on coaches with significant business experience. Somebody who doesn't know what's going on out in the world really can't give the kind of advice that these startup entrepreneurs need. Um, they need to, and, and that, that advisor, that mentor, has to understand about the experiential learning process. You can talk about it all day long, but until you go out and do it, you really don't know. Until you sit across the table from a customer, you don't know what to expect. Um, the original premise that the first pass of the business model is simply a hypothesis encourages and values continuous improvement in their business based on actual data, feedback, and suggestions, and especially criticism from people involved in that business. You learn more from criticism than you do from praise, or in that industry or in that market. The team, is not, uh, uh, the team that is not motivated, is afraid to talk to people outside the comfort zone, or can't bring themselves to, themselves to talk, about, talk to people about an idea are doomed to failure. Or they might get lucky and end up starting a company that ends up being the walking dead. Venture capitalists call the, the companies that won't fail and won't grow like crazy, they just won't die, they're just limping along, those companies are called the walking dead. They just won't die, but they won't thrive either. So. The, the ones, the, the team that can go out and talk to people will have a much better chance. It's really hard, as I said before, sometimes embarrassing. Sometimes you get emotionally vested in the product and your customer tells you that you have an ugly baby. <sighs> you know, it hurts. 
It's a hard process. So Lean Launchpad is primarily evidence-based. You have your startup manifesto with your premise, your hypothesis. You search for your business model. You look around at ways of charging money. You look around at ways of delivering the service or product. You look around at people who might be interested in it. Use evidence-based approach to gather the data that allows you to go back and forth, change your mind, modify your hypothesis, test and evaluate it again, change your mind again, test and evaluate, and change your mind as often as you need. People have been using the term to, uh, pivot to describe that. A pivot is, well, it's been, it's been used so much that you know, I hesitate to even use the word, but uh, to me, a pivot is a radical change in your business model whereas little modifications can be made that'll improve the business model over time. But pivot means you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna spin and do something different. Um, Citizen Groove did that, as a matter of fact. Citizen Groove is a startup company here in Northeast Ohio, and uh, their original idea was something related to records and music for college kids. He pivoted, that's a true pivot, changed it into a company called Decision Desk, which is used at universities around the United States to uh, hold events and seminars and contests. So, the Lean Launchpad is a scientific method that applies to startups. Primary tool for documenting your work, recording data, modifying data, and presenting the outcome is the business model canvas. Now, let's see how many slides I'm behind. Yeah, you're going to pivot back and forth, up and down, up and down, up and down. We break out the discovery phase of the Lean Launchpad to, uh, from the execution phase. You're not ready to execute. All you have is a hypothesis. You may have gathered some data. Keep on going. So the business model can be described in basic building blocks. And let me just, I have a two minute video that uh, will help explain what the business model canvas is all about. the key resources and key activities you're and that's why we don't do live demos at a trade show too loud an organization's business model can be described with nine basic building blocks your customer segments your value proposition for each segment channels to reach customers, customer relationships you establish, the revenue streams you generate, the key resources and key activities you require to create value, the key partners, and the cost structure of the business model. But it's not sufficient to just enumerate the nine building blocks. What you really want to do is to map them out on a pre-structured canvas. This is what we call the Business Model Canvas, a tool that helps you map, discuss, design, and invent new business models. Let's briefly go through the nine building blocks, starting with the customer segments. These are all the people or organizations for which you're creating value. This includes simple users and paying customers. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are the bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. The channels describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. The customer relationships outline the type of relationship you're establishing with your customers. The revenue streams make clear how and through which pricing mechanisms your business model is capturing value. Then you need to describe the infrastructure to create, deliver, and capture value. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model. The key activities show which things you really need to be able to perform well. The key partners show who can help you leverage your business model, since you won't earn all key resources yourself, nor will you perform all key activities. And once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. 
So with the business model canvas, you can map out your entire business model in one image. This works for startup entrepreneurs just as well as for the most senior executives. So, the business model canvas is nine boxes, and each of the boxes captures a different element that the startup needs to identify and nail down, get factual information from the marketplace, the value proposition that the product delivers to the specific customer segments. If you haven't defined your customer segments right, then the value proposition probably won't be right channels so that you will reach your customers and through which your customers can reach you. You'll set up relationships that'll forge that that will the relationships you'll forge in order to get, keep, and grow your customer base. Um, the uh, revenue streams, how and how much you'll be paid. The key participant uh, participants and partnerships that you should pursue, key activities and key resources. Key activities, some of which you don't know how to do key resources, some of which you can't afford to get, which is why you need key partnerships to help you do the things that you need to do and get the assets that you need to get. Um, customer segments are all the people or organizations that are interested in your product. In other words, have the problem that you are trying to solve. Um, each segment, there's a specific value proposition. That is, every segment has a specific value proposition. There's a problem that they solve that your product may or may not fill. The hurdle of, there, there's a bundle of benefits that will create values for your customers. Channels are the touch points where your customers interact with you. Uh, customer relationships describe the way you'll get customers. Customer relationships get, keep, and grow. So you'll get customers. They'll, they'll, you'll describe how they're going to become aware of you, how they're going to become interested in your product, how they're going to become how they decide whether or not to use the product, how they buy the product. Uh, you'll, you'll learn how to keep customers, loyalty, stickiness, or barriers to exit. For example, your cell phone company has probably created some barriers to exit. It's hard to switch your cell phone provider. So if you can do that, more power to you. Um, so how you'll maintain that customer loyalty. How you're going to grow customers upsell them, cross-sell them, unbundle certain features, uh, get referrals. Referrals create a viral loop that you know new customers come in and they love your product and they refer more people. So try and get that. Revenue streams make clear how and through which pricing mechanism you'll capture that value. Key resources describe what assets are indispensable uh, to your business model. Key activities show what things you need to, to do really well in order to be successful. Those are the key activities. And there's a lot of other things. But you're going to have to decide, well, should I ship the order? Should I go down to Office Max and get some more business cards? Decide which are the key activities. Uh, once you understand your business model's idea infrastructure, you'll probably have a better understanding of your cost. The business model canvas builds this in one page. It's designed to force you to use bullet points, no complete sentences, very efficient ways of describing just the information that's supposed to be in that box. So in the customer segments box, you don't have to start at the top. We're going to talk about customer segments here. We know that. <coughs> Pardon me. So you'll just fill in the exact data and information that you need in those boxes. And like the video says, it works for small companies as well as large. BMC is focused entirely, BMC Business Model Canvas, is focused entirely on searching for a value proposition in the marketplace for the fit between the product and the market and the other elements needed to support a viable business. It may in the future be referred to when you start to execute, but by and large, it's just to get you started. In the past and even still, entrepreneurs have told to build a business plan, show how you can execute your idea. The startup pro entrepreneur probably doesn't yet know uh, what steps to execute. In fact, he doesn't even know yet whether it's a good idea. In the past, it was the job of the business plan to force the entrepreneur to figure out how to execute. Today, it's the job of the Lean Launchpad Business Model Canvas to demonstrate whether the entrepreneur should execute and what key steps they should plan for. 
So in my course, I start with boxes one and two. Box one is the value proposition. Box two is the customer segments. Obviously, a value proposition can't exist unless you have a customer segment for whom that proposition has value. So the first question in box one is, which of the customer's problems are we helping to solve? OK, you have to define a customer, so you have to go to box two. Those two boxes are essentially inseparable. But you have to define the customer in one box and the value proposition in the other box. There you'll make the, uh, the effort to describe your customer. Build a picture of that customer. In some cases, you can use an actual picture. This is what my customers look like. Probably won't be a, a, an athlete or somebody famous, a movie star. It'll be somebody that, a picture that you saw on the internet that says, I think my customer's going to look like that. But in most cases, it's a psychological profile of the customer. I don't want to know that it's males 18 to 30. It's very difficult to find a, a product or service that is specifically age related, but I did think of one. If you're selling fake IDs, your market is men and women ages 17 to 20. The younger age limit is because you probably look too young you're to be 21. And when you turn 21, you don't need the product anymore. So it's a very age specific, age related product. I can't think of any other ones. How many people in here have thought that the market for uh, um, Pampers diapers is women 18 to 40, women of childbearing age? Good, because it's not. <laughs> in my class, I ask, how many women are between the ages of 18 and 40? And it's most of them. Uh, and none of them buy Pampers. Well, one, one did. All right, one did. But that's not the market segment. So, tell me about the customer. Does she have strong political leanings? Tell me if she has strong ethics for conservation. What kind of car does or should she drive? How does she feel about her appearance? What kind of food does she eat? What does she, where does she live? How old is she? Is she a college graduate? What major? Married, divorced, kids their ages? Older parent, maybe? Gender preference, cultural background, possibly religious beliefs? Does she drive a Prius or an SUV? Does describe that person, don't just list the demographics. Now that's interesting, but it's not exclusive. It's necessary, but not sufficient. In some cases, they'll be, they'll, the demographics will be important. If someone wants to start a vegan vegetarian restaurant, for example, and a lot of my students are dietitians, and half of them want to start a vegan vegetarian restaurant, I start to, I'd ask them to start describing their customer. It's probably a female, probably but they don't know yet. They'll write that down, female. Uh, she probably drives a Prius. Uh, she's probably a vegetarian or a vegan, or at least more focused on a plant-based diet rather than a meat-based diet. Uh, does she have political leanings left or right? I'm guessing that she leans a little to the left. Uh, did she go to college? Almost certainly. Uh, did, probably doesn't smoke. Does she drink? Probably socially. But does she drink Jack Daniels, Cabernet, or Chardonnay? You know, figure out, find out what drives that person. Describe that person. Figure out how she thinks. Figure out whether she has this problem of not being able to find a vegan or a vegetarian restaurant. So the point is, you've got nothing until, <laughs> you've got nothing until you describe the person you think is your customer. Then you figure out what value does my business idea bring to that specific person. Not to all women. You go back and forth between the customer and the value proposition. All right, is it a vegan restaurant or is it a vegetarian restaurant? All right, we, we think it's a woman is our primary customer, but does she have a significant other who is not a vegetarian? All right, if you have a vegan vegetarian restaurant, do you have to offer something for omnivores? You probably should, because the omnivore is going to veto that restaurant. There's nothing there I'm going to eat. So look at your customer. Your customer isn't just your primary target. It's also going to be a person who can influence the decision. Not so much make the decision, but at least influence. Have veto power, for example. So you're going to have a product idea. You're going to start describing the person who likes that product. Then you go talk to that person you describe to find out if she is at all bothered by the lack of a vegan vegetarian restaurant. 
She can describe the elements of the restaurant, maybe, maybe not have this feature or add that feature. That vegetarian customer can help you design your restaurant. What does she expect when she walks in there? What kind of atmosphere? Is it a noisy restaurant, the kind they put in hard ceilings and sound echoes all over the restaurant? That seems to be the trend lately. I don't know, maybe I'm getting too old. I don't know. <laughs> she can describe the elements uh, you go back and forth between your value proposition and your customer segment until you come up with what your data describes as a product market fit. And that's where box one and box two come together. When you have a product that fits the needs of the market, that solves the problem that your defined market wants solved. Name is self-descriptive, product market fit, and clarifies how the product fits, meets the needs of your defined market and just your defined market. Go back to the smart car. That's a defined market. A well-defined product that serves a particular need for a particular market niche. I don't think I'd ever want to drive one, but they're not trying to sell it to me. They're trying to sell it to the people who like those kinds of cars. So now you know who you're selling to or you think you know. You have some data about your customer. You have some data about your product that serves the needs of the customers. Now you're using the scientific method to prove your business model. And that's the whole purpose of the lean launchpad methods. I don't even know why I brought slides. Oh, there's the business model canvas. You all have that, so I don't have to leave it up here. Now, you're still in the search mode. You are not in the execute mode yet. And look at where your cash flow is going. Over time, you're going to start out, you don't have anything. You're going to figure out what the customers need. You're going to find some funding. If, if you actually need funding, you're going to try and bootstrap it uh, first. But figure out, describe what you're going to reach, how you're going to reach that customer. How's that customer going to hear about you? How does the customer expect to hear about you? If I have an online service, I wouldn't expect to read about it in the Super Bowl. Well, GoDaddy.com proved that wrong. GoDaddy.com is an online service. You can't go down to the store and buy it. Totally online, and yet they bought TV advertising to promote their products. So you can't generalize about things like that. How does your customer expect to reach you? How will you deliver that product? Through what channels? all the things on the business model canvas. Let me go back to that. Moving to box four, customer relationships. When I first read that box, I thought it was how close do you want to get to your customer and vice versa. For example, I defy anybody in this room to go look on Google's website and find a phone number for customer service. Google does not want to talk to you. They, they, it's impossible. They don't have a customer service department like, for example, Time Warner does. And probably half the people in this room talk, call Time Warner every month. They have a huge customer service uh, department. I use that term loosely. So, <laughs> no, I'm not up here to rant. I love Time Warner. That's where I get my internet. Without them, I'd be dead. So, um, I thought, okay, how close do I want to get? Um, Google doesn't want to talk. Google can't possibly hire enough people to answer all the phone calls they'd be getting. However, Google being hands off, everything you need to know is on their website. And even better, they made their product so simple and so clean, totally in contrast to all the other websites that were out there. The other websites at the time Google hit the market, we wanted to put banner ads here and, and, and GIFs over here. We cluttered up that web page. So Anywhere you clicked, you got, a, you got an ad served up to you. Google said, no, we don't want to do that. We're going to make it nice and clean and easy to use. People are going to search. But when they search, we're going to record that. And I'll tell you, I was looking, I, was, I went online last week, and I'm looking for a pair of Sperry Top Siders. Find the best price, best store, maybe order them online. And I will tell you, Within minutes, not hours, not days, within minutes, every other web page I went to had an advertisement for a topsider style shoe on the bottom of that page. It didn't take an hour. So 
That's what Google does. Now, who's the customer? Your users, you use Google every day, but they get paid by the advertisers. So they understand how to develop a multi-sided market. So they have users and they have payers. A lot like the health system. You go in for cardiac surgery, the surgeon decides he needs a special device to pull your mitral valve to one side, and he goes to the buyer at Cleveland Clinic and says, I need this device. Cleveland Clinic goes to you and buys the device. So who's your customer? The Cleveland Clinic. Who ends up paying? The insurance company. Pays Cleveland Clinic to reimburse them for the purchase of your product that they paid for based on the, the requirement from the doctor. But you as the patient are the beneficiary. That's a really complicated market. So, um, box five is the revenue streams. How do you make money? How much should we charge? The revenue model tells us how we're going to make money, and the pricing model tells us how much we're going to make. And the pricing model also tells us how we're going to compete with our, with our competitors out there. Uh, box six, our partners are necessary because you can't do everything by yourself. You need partners. And a partner is not typically your supplier. You have a supplier relationship where you order products, they ship it, you pay for it. That's not a partner. That's a supplier and a vendor. Um, your partners are companies or individuals that can help you do things that you can't do otherwise. If you're trying to bootstrap your company and you need a piece of capital equipment that's, I don't know, a couple of hundred thousand dollars, it's possible, and I have done it, called my customer and said, I can't get this piece of equipment. Could you buy it with your capital budget and lease it to me? Then the company that bought the equipment ends up with a tax write-off because they can depreciate the equipment. I get a tax write-off because I can expense my lease payments. The government is paying for my machine, and I get it for what is a lease payment as opposed to a huge capital expenditure. There's lots of ways you can change your revenue stream and your cost structure. Key activities, things you have to do well. Manufacturing, marketing, uh, software. Right, what else is it? There's lots of things that a company has to do well. There are limits what you can find on, there are lists uh, 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 that you can find on the internet that will guide you through all the things that a company has to do well. So, let's see where we are. So, customer discovery, customer validation, it's all, you're not making money yet. The business model canvas helps you with the search. The business plan is what you need to execute. Now. As I, admit, as I said, the business plan is still important, but everybody knows what happens to the business plan with first customer contact. Yeah, the fact is, your business plan is probably going to be wrong, and, and everybody's told me that it's obsolete as soon as you finish writing it. But without it, you don't know what you need. Eisenhower could not have pulled off D-Day if he hadn't had a business plan. And sure, some of the people landed on the wrong beach. The Germans decided they didn't, they thought it was a decoy and they weren't going to do anything about it. Things go wrong that your business plan didn't foresee, but without it, you don't know what resources you need. You don't know what kind of intellectual property you're going to need. You don't know what kind of human resources you're going to need. You don't know. So that's why you have to have a business plan. Even though it's obsolete, even though it will probably be wrong, it's still better than going blindly down the road. So, while we who teach Lean Launchpad kind of tend to poo-poo the business plan because we're not teaching that yet, uh, you will. You'll have it. So, who's teaching the Lean Launchpad methods? I help teach the uh, National Science Foundation's i core Sites program at the University of Akron. National Science Foundation has gotten behind 100% the Lean Launchpad methodology. They've given grants to universities across the United States for the i -Corps Sites Program and the i -Corps, uh Go, Paul, what's the, what's the second? i -Corps Go, teams. teams, right. So the sites feed the teams. University of Akron is a site. So every semester, we teach a five-week course uh, in, uh, that's led by the University of Akron Research Foundation. And we go through the Lean Launchpad. We go through intellectual property. 
we demand that these scientists that are bringing the technology out of the University of Akron, and that's the point. The point is to commercialize the technology that we universities have. And Barry Rosenbaum loves to say this. What the government grants do, the SBIR grants and all the research grants that the government hands out, they're taking money, the researchers, and turning that money into knowledge. They write their papers, they present their papers, they get tenure, and that paper goes on the shelf. And here is, in some cases, fabulous technology that, in some cases, has an actual commercial purpose. The professors don't get rewarded for that. In fact, they are penalized when they take time out from their research to help commercialize their earlier research. That research is done. What are you doing that for? So the problem of commercializing technology at, at universities is well known, well documented, and, it, and is being changed at the University of Akron. And uh, I know that uh, Kent State University has a huge uh, entrepreneurship program, including the Blackstone Launch, uh, Blackstone Launchpad. Um, and as I mentioned, I'm on the board of directors of the Entrepreneurship Education Consortium. Aside from Kent and Akron, there's nine other universities here in Northeast Ohio that teach Lean Launchpad and use this method and are trying to move their students into a place or a time or a condition where they can actually execute on their ideas. And while I've criticized some of the students playing small ball, some of them are big. Some of them have huge opportunities that it's hard, it's hard for them to, to bring that to the marketplace. And that's what the i -Corps Sites is trying to do. Um, and basically, the i -Corps programs, both the sites and the teams, serve as a vetting process for SBIR grants. You can triple your probability of getting an SBIR grant if you go through the i -Corps programs. So, and that teaches Lean Launchpad. NIH is doing the same thing. And these other universities all teach the Lean Launchpad. You may recognize some of them. I don't know why the Michigan one is in the middle, but I couldn't change it. <laughs> Sorry about that. And I don't see Ohio State up there. So that's who's teaching the i programs, a short list. Can we teach this stuff? Darn right. The Lean Launchpad methods make it possible for entrepreneurs to focus on the things that they need to know now before they spend a lot of money on something else. It's a process, it's learnable, it's teachable, and it's a fully developed curriculum. And I've gotten so much stuff uh, from uh, Steve Blank's website. And in fact, my students have to watch Steve Blank's uh, How to Build a Startup video on Udacity.com. So, what's traditionally been seen as an art that few master as startups is now a science. And people are coming out of the woodwork. People who would never have considered how to start a business. People who call me up and says, Bob, what do I do? What do I do next? And I was kind of surprised when one of my students <laughs> sent me a note a couple of weeks ago. He says, Bob, my wife's been planning her dog training business for months. I was planning what? Go do it. Find a place where you can have it and find some customers who need it. Dog training is not rocket surgery. I mean, you can go out and, and find people that have dogs that need training. And sure enough, one of the professors at the university just last week was driving down Arlington in Akron, and there's this stray dog walking down the double yellow line. He pulled off the road, got the dog in his car, put up signs, and, and got on the internet. Lost dog. There's, there's actually lost dog pages on the internet. I didn't know that. And he must have, you know, given all the internet publicity, there must have been 10,000 people who saw that this dog was found on Arlington Street and nobody claimed him. Problem is, he's not house trained. So I hooked up the professor with my student and I'm hopeful that they're teaching each other. Whereby the professor is teaching the student how to do a startup and the wife is teaching the dog how to behave. So it's, it's difficult, but it's a method, and it's well documented, and it's proven. And that's about all I have for today. Can I take any questions? Can we walk through a business model canvas, for example? 
How many of you have a business idea that you just, you, you think you want to do? Nobody in this room. One, two, three, four. Go to udacity.com, look for Steve Blank or how to build a startup. That will get you through the preliminary steps. And his videos are, com are interesting and logical and rational, uh, but it's not the only thing you need to do. You've got to sit down and figure out what kinds of questions, what kinds of data do you need to prove that your problem solution is one that customers really want. You had it in your head. You understood intuitively. Yeah. You get it. <laughs> right. You don't. You didn't have a booth, did you? No, I did not. You're, you're carrying around like. Psst, psst, yeah. Wanna buy? <laughs> There's something here. Boy, can I. <laughs> there's, there's been a lot of examples of disruption. Amazon, of course, uh, just created havoc in the, uh, in the bookstore industry. How many of you still use a travel agent? I remember when I was, when I was selling uh, satellite communication systems, I'd have to go to China a lot. Like 22 times I've been to China. And uh, every time I would use a travel agent. If one of the flights got delayed, everybody else on the airplane was standing in front of the ticket counter trying to get their ticket fixed. I got on the phone to my travel agent. She had access to everything. I could then take my ticket up to the airline that I was traveling on and say, such such an airline is going to the same place. It's leaving in an hour and a half. Can you change my ticket? Because my travel agent had already made the, the reservation. That industry's essentially gone. Not completely, but essentially gone. What other industries are getting disintermediated or disrupted? How many people think higher education is getting disrupted? Let me tell you. You can get an online MBA from my alma mater, Ohio University. Totally online. Everything in the MBA course, taught online. You can take courses from Harvard University, from MIT, for free. There are people who are proposing that the online universities, what they call the University of Everywhere, is going to be available for free to anybody anywhere in the world, taught by subject matter experts that are at the top of their field. Well, that might be a pipe dream, but certainly the reality lies somewhere in between the bricks and mortar facilities that we have now and the totally 100% online. Okay, it's kind of hard to duplicate a genome processing lab in your, in your basement. You know, you might still have to come to the bricks and mortar <clears throat> to get into a laboratory where you can do tests. Yeah, oh, online testing is, is well known and documented. We have, we have ways where we can, we can monitor the person with a camera person remotely taking the test, they go to a lockdown browser, they can't switch out of that browser until the test is complete. If they leave, they, uh, the, the test is, is over. They have to have their hands in sight so they can't be looking at a piece of paper down underneath the table. There are ways of doing online testing. There are ways of getting around online testing. Yeah, yeah, yes.
Do you want to buy this clicker? I'm just inventing this clicker. Do you want to buy one? Of course they're going to say yes. They look in your eyes and say, yeah, he wants me to say yes. No. Do you have the problem of flick of tw switching slides on a, on a PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, I have that problem. What have you done in the past? You don't tell them, well, you have a clicker that can do that, because frankly, you don't. You don't have the clicker yet. You're still in the discovery phase. You can't sell them one even if they wanted to buy it, because you haven't built it yet. So you ask them, what do you do now? Well, I walk up to the computer and I push the button. How's that working out for you? Yeah, it's a little clumsy. When I come over here, I'm out of reach of the microphone. So what have you tried in the past? Well, I tried, I tried a stick. I tried one of those selfie sticks that I use with my camera to take a selfie. That tends to work, but sometimes I miss. Ask them what they've done. How, how would they like to see this problem solved? Don't say you have the solution. Ask them, how would you like to see this problem solved? Well, you know, if I could just, if I could just do a brain meld with my computer, that would solve the problem. OK, write that down. You know, maybe crazy. How else would you like to see it? Well, I could hire an assistant. You know, how's that working out for you? I don't even know when to click my own slides, for God's sakes. <laughs> so how are they going to know? Then you might say, is there, is there a device that can move the computer forward? It might be infrared. Your TV remotes are all infrared. This isn't. This is Bluetooth. It goes into a little receiver that's plugged into my USB port. So I don't even have to point the thing. I can actually put it in my pocket, and it still works. But ask them what they've done. Ask them how that's worked out for them. Ask them, how big a problem is this not being able to change slides on your PowerPoint? How big a problem is that? Is it costing you money? How much money? You know, my product development process has taken too long. We start the product development process, and lo and behold, something goes wrong. Um, sheet. Well, yes. That was a wonderful, wonderful example. The only thing I would add is then have under 100 people. Oh, yeah. Emergence. That is critical. Okay. Right. That, that would be right. What other features would you like to have on this device? Boy, I sure wish it had a laser pointer. Oh, okay. We could write it down. No, I wish it had a calculator in it. Boy, I'd sure like to have a timer on this thing. I'd like to be able to set a timer that automatically flipped the slides forward every so many seconds. You know, mine doesn't have that. Mine doesn't even have a laser pointer. I got the, I got the smart car model. There was a question back here uh, somewhere. Yeah. Kind of. Is that the question? Oh, no. What you're doing, the, there's a new word for that. Market research, you know, we don't, we don't and it's one-on-one. -on -one. The market research is never a focus group. You don't want to get in a room with 10 people and have them interface with each other unless you're doing a brainstorming session, in which case you need, you know, five to 10 people. And you need a, a monitor to write things down, and you need somebody who can, who can, uh, facilitate the discussion, who can direct people around. That's, a, that's a, a, a one way of doing the research. But in the Lean Launchpad, it's always one-on-one. -on -one. The, the, and you're going to do a lot of them. And what you're doing is what people call crowdsourcing. You're crowdsourcing your product ideas. That's trending like crazy right now. So, you know, it's not bad. So is market research, it's search. It's trying to find the right solution to a problem that your customers have. You might not even know what the problem is. You might think there's a problem. We had one project uh, in the i program where the researcher at the University of Akron developed a paint that, when stressed, would emit a flash of light. You know, it's been published, you know, the idea is out there. 
and they thought, what a great idea for bridges. We will paint all the bridges in, in all the states and we'll monitor the flashes on these bridges and we'll know when the bridges are stressed. Obvious uh, product. Why don't we just go ahead and make all this paint that we can use to paint bridges? Fortunately, the team went out and talked to the Departments of Transportation in Ohio and all the adjacent states. Not one, not one of those Departments of Transportation indicated that they had a problem measuring the stress on their bridge. They know how to measure stresses on their bridge. They've been doing it for decades. It's cheap, it's easy, it's accurate. They know which bridges need fixing. He said, we don't need your paint. Don't want your paint. So the team went back. Now what? You know, their original problem, their hypothesis that this problem exists, didn't exist. Their target customer, Departments of Transportation, said, we don't want your product. Can't even give it to us. So they went out and found another customer segment. And they're going great guns with that one. Anybody know what it is? Huh. If you're testing wings, you want to know in real time the stress patterns on that wing. Now the only way to do it is to mount thousands of sensors all over the surface of the wing. Boy, it's a lot easier to just paint that wing and take pictures of it. You get little light flashes all over the wing wherever it stresses. Very cool stuff. So. That's what the Lean Launchpad has done for just one team. And we push through anywhere between eight and 10 teams a semester. Some of them crash and burn, which is better than spending $100,000 of somebody else's or their own money to figure out, oops, departments of transportation don't need my paint, don't want my paint. So it works, saves money. It improves the likelihood of success by a wide margin. And it could lead you down to the SBIR, down the SBIR path to get actual research money from the government. Non-dilutive, essentially free money. You don't have to sell stock for it. Yes? Don't compete on price, right. Yeah, because that has been a solid benchmark in my business for many, many years. Yeah, why do you cut your price? Why would you? Why would I? <laughs> yeah, I mean, why? Because uh, there's a need for that. And there's competitive pressure. Not anymore. OK. So now you can set whatever price <laughs> your no. customers will bear. Uh, to a degree, yeah. yeah. Well, clearly, yes. There's, uh, every generalizations are false, including this one. So, uh, but I'm, I'm suggesting to startups, and a lot of my students feel that the way to get into a business is to find an idea and then come in at a lower price and take the business away from the existing competitor. And that's what I tell them not to do. Find a way to charge more and charge more. One of the i teams this semester has a competitor who's charging $100, I'm sorry, $8,000 for the competitive product. And this team wants to come in and sell their product, which is competitive to the existing market, for 100 bucks. No, I'm serious. What? And, and I was one of the three judges up at the front who were asking questions of this team. And I said, why would you want to sell an $8,000 product for 100 bucks? Why don't you come in at $79.95? That way you're not starting a price war and you're going to get that money. And as a startup, you need that money. You can't afford to start a price war. You need cash. Yeah. Yes.
Well, from this, I would, I would say the revenue streams and the cost structure will provide a framework for your income statement. And your income statement is going to be based on your estimate of how much you're going to be able to sell. How many units, how much service, how many users. Uh, it's also going to be based on your revenue model. Are you going to charge a subscription? It's going to be a one transaction. All the different ways of extracting money from your customers. So this begins to move into the income statement. Um, I always tell my students, give me three years, your best estimate at three years. Because Lord knows you don't know what it's going to look like out in 2020. I don't think anybody knows what it's going to look like in the year 2020. But give me three years of your best estimate. How many units, to whom are you going to sell them? How many customers are you going to have? And I don't, I don't, if they come back and say, we believe we can get this many customers. Uh, sorry, I don't care what you believe. What do the customers tell you? You've interviewed 500 people. How many of them have this problem that your solution solves? It's, it's way premature. Yeah. What's the alternative? Yeah, what are the alternatives? And, you know, if you're going in and, and here's the pivot that they're going to yeah. bring back to Yeah, the pivot thing, yeah. <laughs> oh, fake IDs, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Make up. <laughs> right, right. There's, yeah, there's follow on products, yeah. Yeah. You know that there's real data out there, but they're not they're not well, they're getting it. This is this is areas where they have both of them have different things and different uh, approaches, but uh -huh. the problem is the same. You know, there, there's there's a potential for limitations of how many they can support, and there's also potential either acceptance or resistance at certain price levels. And now the question is how do we test that and how do we bring that you know the, the curve of the optimum position of price on that? Uh, right. The old the old econ 101 curves, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, you know, it's it's that again is a hard problem. And if there was an easy answer, people would be doing it every day. Uh, my my best advice, and I give it all the time, is to try and find out from the customer during the face to face customer interviews if you can establish a rapport with that person. Try and find out how much the problem is costing them, um, and that's. You know, they don't really know half the time. So uh, I don't have a, an easy answer for that. But how much does it cost you? What have you tried in the past? Um, if there was a perfect solution, what would it look like to you? Uh, if you just ask them, how much would you be willing to pay for it? They don't know. They don't know what the product is. Yeah, they'll look in your eye, right? <laughs> I want this $8,000 lens replaced with 100 bucks. Yeah. I don't want to pay eight thousand dollars. I know that. Yes. Well, the answer for less is not necessarily a killer deal because you have to manage the execution of whatever you're selling, yeah. manufacturing, whatever. So uh, pricing uh, pricing is not. I don't think it has to be an absolute absolute thing that you need to charge. Yeah. They're going to say whatever it is, I just paid too much for it. Yeah, I see. They're going to yeah. want it for less. Yeah. Most of the time, though, I, how you're going to, what other people are going to be involved selling it. Because you have to have a price approach, depending on the product, you have to have a price approach in every industry that you can get to work on. So if they sell it, they have it, they have to be able to handle that product as well. Yeah, we go into detail about the distribution channels. Everybody has to make money at it. So, mm -hmm. 
Th exactly right. There's different, and there's different products that solve different problems. But it's still food. It's not a vegan vegetarian. There's a restaurant down. You're right. There's a restaurant down off a of public square called Pura Vida. Uh, it uh, has a large vegetarian offering, but it's a great restaurant for omnivores too. So, yeah, what's the product? The product is coming into a nice restaurant and sitting with a person who can eat what she, what she wants and eat what I want. And I, I appreciate that they have more than one solution. What's the alternative product do? How well does it do it? Um, sometime, in some cases, the alternative, so long, Julie, the alternative is to do nothing. You know, I don't, I don't need that product. I don't want that product. That product is too expensive. Um, I don't need a car. I have a bicycle. You know, I, I wouldn't even buy a smart car. I've got my bicycle. You know? there, there's a lot of them that aren't getting their driver's licenses. Yeah. And why do they need a car? They have Uber. For the price of a thousand Uber rides, they still couldn't buy a car. Well, maybe they could, but, you know. So. Uh huh. Can anybody help out with that? Does anybody know any 3D printers? Yeah, he can take a drawing, convert it to a CAD drawing, and plug it into the machine, and it spits out. The problem is, it's all only going to be plastic right now. Yeah, that's all right. So you're still going to have to have something that lights up and has a circuit in it. But yeah, you can, have, you can have prototypes made. One of the things that I did not touch on during my talk was the concept of a minimum viable product. There are times when you have an idea of what the product's going to look like, and you go to a 3D printer and you make it up. Um, I, was, <laughs> I was teaching uh, an entrepreneurship course to fourth, fifth, and sixth graders at Gilmore Academy a few years ago. And uh, one of the kid's parents had a 3D printer. He was in that business. And he came to class with, with a mock-up of his little thingy that he was working on. It was, I was blown away. I thought, wow, now I understand what it looks like and how big it is. And, you know, it's bigger and smaller than a bread box. So yeah, there, there are places that I don't know. I don't have any contacts there for you. But there are places that do that. We have a 3D printer at Beer's Library on the University of Akron. You can go to the library at Akron U and print up something. Yeah, it's small. It's not going to be. It's, it's, even small, you can hold it and look at it. See, it's going to look like this. And that's what they do with architecture. They make little styrofoam cutouts. It's going to look like this. Ooh. <laughs> and the product and the, the, the design is sold. So. Um, one of the things, I, like I said, I didn't touch on was, was the concept of an MVP. The first product that a startup is going to come out with is not going to be the one that's gold-plated, has all the bells and whistles. It's going to be the product that basically solves the basic problem that the customer wants. Not five market segments, one customer, one customer segment, one archetype, if you will, likes this idea. And you can show it to them and say, you know, we were thinking that a product that might solve this problem looks like this. And they might tell you, oh, it's, uh, it's too big. Or they might just say, oh, do you have it in red? <laughs> in which case, your answer is yes. <laughs> so minimum viable products go a long way toward crystallizing the thoughts in people's heads. So other disruptions, OK, travel agencies, higher education, uh, digital picture frames. 
Your watch, right. Yeah, who, who's, who's the CEO of Apple now? Tim Cook, right. He's telling us what kind of watch we're gonna get. Uh, other company, Google comes out with things. Microsoft, Microsoft uh, always has big press conferences when they wanna release a, a new piece of buggy software. Uh, no, I don't use an Apple, honestly, I really don't. Don't know how to. I'm not smart enough to use an Apple product. My wife will testify to that. Um, but I drank the Microsoft Kool-Aid, sorry. Uh, what else uh, has been disrupted that you can, anybody have any examples? Like why isn't Sears Amazon? Why isn't Western Union PayPal? Why isn't Walmart? Well, Walmart is everything it wants to be. And it's not Target. Exactly right. Yeah. Target, Walmart. Who, who, who votes for Target? Who likes Target better than Walmart? Who likes Walmart better than Target? Okay. And you know, other people don't have any, any, any preference. So Target's winning. Target's going big. When is Sears going to go out of business? <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, I went and shopped there a couple of times. That's, that's what people went to Sears for, though. You didn't buy anything at Sears except craftsmen. Craftsmen tools, and doggone it, if one broke, they would replace it. My old man had a rough, a, a, a bolt, big bolt that he needed to, to loosen. He put a wrench on it and wouldn't loosen. He put a big, long pipe as a helper bar on this wrench, and he managed to get that nut off of there. And of course, it bent the wrench. He took it down to Sears and said, your wrench bent. And the guy gave him a new one, and on his way out the door, the salesman says, how big a helper bar did you put on that wrench? He knew. It didn't matter. It was under warranty. So somebody's, now, somebody's going to buy the Sears brand. Somebody brought the Polaroid brand, Edwin Land. And Edwin Land invented polarized lenses, the kind you get in your sunglasses, the kind you have on, mag on, on uh, uh, microscopes. He invented polarized lenses. Then he invented instant photography. His business model was, every time you push that button, you are going to buy a piece of paper from me that big, and it's going to cost you a dollar and a half, or a dollar, or whatever it was. Every time you push a button, I get a dollar. Perfect. Yes. The the numbers just boggle my mind, and the ethics just destroy my confidence in in big business. So, Kodak said, ah, we think this digital camera thing is, uh, is a danger to our film and paper business. They had, and as, as Kodak was going down, I got their annual report and I looked, they had just listed in the annual report 27 vice presidents, all dedicated to selling paper and film, and in some cases, plastic uh, single-use cameras. That was their entire business. They didn't know how to manufacture electronics. They didn't understand that somebody's going to eat your lunch. It might as well be you. They could not make that transition, and it breaks my heart that that iconic company was driven out of business because 27 vice presidents couldn't see the writing on the wall. That just, I, it just blows me away. There you go. And, and like I said before, Ooh, that's an indictment. The same thing they did, but how did they get there? By doing this, this, and this? Okay, then that's, that's what I'll do. So you're right. And IBM, you know, there are, there are hundreds, probably thousands of examples, but one that I like to bring up every time. IBM was the manufacturer of hard drives, the only manufacturer of hard drives because they had the IBM 360. And their, their hard drive platters were 14 inches across, bigger than a pie, 14 inches across platters. 
and they, they just made all the hard drives. Digital Equipment Corporation and Data General, they were making small computers, like maybe as big as this, this uh, lectern. But they couldn't use these 14-inch platters. They were just too big to fit in the box. So they came out with an 8-inch drive. And IBM, following all the laws and rules that they learned at Harvard Business School, went to their customers and said, here's our 14-inch drive and here's the 8-inch drive. Which do you prefer? And the customer says, well, which holds more data? Oh, the 14-inch drive holds a lot more data. Well, then why are you even asking us about the 8-inch drive? Well, it turns out, as the technologies evolved, the, the ability to read and write off of the hard drive became hypercritical in, in the way the speed of the processors. If you took too long to read off the hard drive, everything slowed down. The problem with the 14-inch platters is they tended to wobble on the spindle. So you couldn't get the magnetic head close enough to the, to the platter to read the data. All of a sudden, they were the slowest hard drive out on the marketplace, and these 8-inch platters would spin like crazy, and you could read data off of them 10 times faster. Overnight, those 14-inch platters went away, and IBM was out of the hard drive business. It was incredible. And then somebody came out with a, uh, uh, it was eight and a half, and five and a quarter, and then three and a half, yeah. And now, you can't even buy a computer that can read a floppy drive anymore. A three and a half inch floppy drive? Sorry, can't do it. My wife has a, 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 a videotape of her son's graduation, is it? And uh, we don't have anything to play it on. Sorry. We're going to have to take it someplace who has an antique piece of equipment to play this videotape. Not, and it's not a VHS or, or beta. It's a little cassette video, high end. You're going to have to have a transfer to a DVD. Can't read it. So there are stories over and over again. The hard drive industry has been decimated five times now. And oh, by the way, five years from now, you probably won't have rotating hard drives anymore because the cost of solid state memory is going to be so cheap and they are so much faster than a hard drive, hard drives will go away. Your phone has more storage than my first computer had in it and it's on a micro SD card. I can, I can foresee the time when you can get a terabyte on an SD card. Put it in your phone. Put it in your, I don't know, anywhere. Yeah, and that's the next. Then there's the next thing. Right. We're going to obviate solid state memory because all we need is internet. We have infinite storage on the, in the cloud. Now, and that is going to be a huge transition. Cable TV is getting disintermediated. Satellite to a you know, probably just as much. One of my startups back in the 90s <clears throat> was a company called StoragePoint.com. StoragePoint.com was your storage place on the internet. We didn't even have the term in the cloud before. We didn't know what the cloud was. Nobody ever used it. We just said, we're going to store your files on the internet. What a great idea, which by the way is the cloud. People would come and say, where are my files? They're on the internet. Where on the internet? Yeah, yeah, where on the internet, exactly. The problem that we had was not that we didn't have a market for it. Even then, I, I was uh, the VP of marketing, and I went and found a, a radiologist whose business was to take full body scans of patients on their own dime. This was not covered by any insurance. It was just completely, he'll do, the, he'll do the scan on your body, head to toe, and he will find things wrong with you. And he'll recommend you to a, to a specialist so that you can do preventive health care. And he had these humongous files, x-ray files, digitized. And he wanted to find a place to store them. He didn't have, he couldn't afford all that storage on his machines. He came to us and says, can you store this stuff? I said, well, there's HIPAA requirements. So first of all, your scans have to be digitized at the beginning, of course. Then they have to be encrypted when we send them over the internet. Yes, we do that. 
Oh, then they have to be encrypted while they're in storage, so if somebody downloads the file, they can't read it. Yes, we do that too. So yes, we have your solution. Great, how do I do it? Well, you get your dial-up modem, and you upload at, what was it, 64 kilobits per second? Megabyte files, probably 10 or 20 megabyte files. It would take days, weeks, to upload a single file. So, the lesson that I learned is that being wrong and being too early are indistinguishable from each other. We didn't have broadband internet. All we had was dial-up. We couldn't store files in the cloud, even though we could. Nobody could get them there. And nobody could get them back because, doggone it, a megabyte took like three hours to download on a dial-up. And half the time, your dial-up line would drop, and you'd have to start from scratch again. It was just an unacceptable problem, solution. And, and so we had to close the company. We ran out of angel funding. We ran out of venture capital funding. We tried to get a bridge loan, but the guy wanted our firstborn child. And I said, fine. I didn't have any kids. <laughs> I wouldn't give him my car, though. Anyway, so there's a lot of things that you can anticipate and some things that you can't. But doggone it, you got to go out and search. You got to find the people who have this problem and see if your solution fits what they see as a solution for them. For them, not for everybody else. And polarize your market. Build a smart car. Build a Scion XT3. Build, I don't know, none of the car companies anymore manufacture the old style vans that we used to get when we were teenagers. You know, when this van's rocking, don't come knocking. Yeah, that sort of thing. Um, they don't make those anymore. They have new kinds of, of vehicles that are more suited to commercial work, more suited to carrying people around. Minivans put the big vans out of business, essentially. And now commercial vans are going away. Polly, are we close? No, we're, we still have 20, 20 minutes. Any more questions? Yes. Yes, in fact, uh, a lot. The, the next video after this one is Eric Reese talking about the uh, uh, how to build a startup. Yeah. Oh, they're hand in hand. Eric Reese helped to develop this with Steve Blank. They're like joined at the hip. So, yeah. Um, if I if I hadn't shut the video off, the Eric Reese video starts automatically after my two minute. Uh, business model canvas video. So, um, anybody who wants a copy of my edited slides, because I was editing these things right up until I had to get in the car and come down here from Cleveland. So there are a few edits, not a lot, but a few. Um, I also have uh, um, the uh, speech uh, in Word. So uh, as I'm reading my slides, I have uh, Dragon Naturally Speaking software. So as I'm talking, my computer is typing out what I am saying. This reminds me of a Twilight Zone show that I saw back when I was a young boy. And the alien came to Earth, and he would talk to the typewriter, which then magically typed his words. And here we are, just 50 years later, <laughs> and it's a reality. I got a headphone and a microphone, a headset and a microphone that uh, records my voice really well and converts it to text. The problem is it always spelled lean, L-I-E-N, as in Leon Launchpad. Or else if it wasn't lean, it was Lee, Lee Launchpad. So I guess my pronunciation needs to improve. Yeah. And, and you put it in. Are coming back. But the headphones today have uh, noise canceling systems. So there is no other sound except the pure music or the pure. New vinyl. Boy, there's an oxymoron if I ever heard one. Why? <laughs> it's kind of cool. It's very retro. Yeah. We were talking. 
My undergrad is in electrical engineering, and I couldn't wait to get rid of vacuum tubes. When I was in the Navy, I was a crypto technician before I went to college. And our cryptography equipment was based on high cutoff pentode vacuum tubes. I mean, they were little, little, you know, peanut sized vacuum tubes, but there were like a thousand of them in there. Oh, I do. My old man would take me down to the drugstore and he would plug this vacuum tube into a device and, and it would get hot and tell you if it was good or bad. Wow. So technology changes a lot. Yeah. They have a, a legalized monopoly to carry. Now, actually, that's, that, that's not exactly true. Time Warner was first with the most in this, in this area. So they got on the telephone pole. Now, if you go to the telephone company and say, hey, I want to attach another wire to your, to your pole, they're going to say, sorry, you can't do it. You can see the pole's too crowded already. So that's kind of a natural monopoly. And in, when, I was, when I was in the cable industry, uh, there were cable companies that tried to overbuild existing cable companies because they were so awful. And wherever the new company was coming in and building out this, the system, the existing cable company would come in and cut the price for the subscribers in that neighborhood. And I thought that wasn't ethical. If you're going to cut the price, you've got to cut the price for everybody. No, no, no. It's just the people in this neighborhood so that they don't switch over to the new cable company. I know. Right, right. And, and that's exactly what happens. So now, no cable company will overbuild another cable company. And besides, we're down to like three or four now. Back then, back in the uh, was early 80s, early to mid 80s, the headline in the Philadelphia Inquirer talked about the negotiations with city council and Comcast, who coincidentally is headquartered in Philadelphia. Philadelphia didn't have cable because Comcast wasn't going to agree to the terms that the city of Philadelphia wanted, this many free local origination channels, and all this you know, brainiac stuff that nobody wanted. But the, the city council people wanted to show to the people of Philadelphia that they were concerned about the little guy. Sorry, all that 98% of the people want to do is watch HBO or the broadcast channels. We had, we had the, the program channel segregated by broadcast channels, ABC, CBS, and NBC, and the satellite channels, uh, Discovery Channel and Arts and Entertainment. ESPN was just getting started. I remember going home, I was in business school, went home for the summer, came back for the second year, and my best friend came and said, Bob, have you heard about this new channel? It is the coolest thing. It's called MTV. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. This was 1981, and it was summer, the summer between first year and second year in business school, and he went home to Kansas, and he saw MTV on his cable system there, and he was blown away. So, yeah, I've seen the whole evolution of cable, and it's going to get disintermediated. Now, the problem is, for us individuals is, that even if we get our video programming somewhere else, cable has a natural monopoly on high bandwidth delivery to the home for the time being. Now, Google is trying to disintermediate that. Google wants to take the cable companies to task and lay fiber and offer 1,000 megabits per second, not just 50 megabits per second. We're going we're gonna to do not 10 times faster. We're going to do 20 times faster than you can do now. We are going to out bandwidth the bandwidth kings. Yeah. Trenching is the big issue. Who's going to pay for the trench? Once the trench is built, boy, it's like, who, who was it? What was the cartoon where the, the, the chicken wanted to make bread? Who's going to help me plant the wheat? Who's going to help me pick the wheat? I forget what, what fairy tale that was. Right. 
So chicken, this is like Chicken Little, a little red hen, okay. And somebody's gonna dig the trench and doggone it, everybody's gonna pile on. Outages. That's not right. Would the city of Akron and the city of Cleveland be a more beautiful place if we didn't have wires running down the street? And would the, do you think electrical power would be more reliable if the wind didn't knock the wires off the poles or knock the poles down? So we'd have better electricity. But you know what's going to happen, though. Okay. The next disintermediation is going to be the electrical distributors. Now, First Energy is, a, is an electrical generator. They have a lot of coal power generators, and they're fighting this green thing all the way, which is appropriate. First Energy, being in the business that they're in, has to protect their in the installed investment, which is the coal generators. They can't, they can't just drop them, so they have to keep those going, so they're going to fight the green movement. But <clears throat> there, are, there are industries coming on stream that will distribute the power generation from just one or two big coal generators to thousands thousands of small generators in your backyard, whether it's a wind turbine or, a, or a, a geothermal or solar panels, you will have thousands of these little generators all over the place. They all want to tap into the electrical grid to sell their excess energy back to First Energy. First Energy hates that. So they put in a lot of artificial barriers. Oh, you can't do that because safety. They'll, they'll, set, they'll go to the regulatory agencies and say, yeah, you got to fight You got to write a regulation that says people can't do that. Well, why? Well, because it'll upset our rate base. So you're going to see, though, that the old-style coal generators are going to be made obsolete. And it's going to happen in most of our lifetimes, probably in your lifetime, certainly in my lifetime. The, problem, the next problem, then, is we have to build a new distribution system because the distribution system that we designed is designed to take electricity in one direction, from the generator to your house. All of a sudden, you want to send it backwards. Oh no, there's all kinds of switches and relays and stuff in the system that doesn't let that happen. So the grid has to be rebuilt. So there is where we're going to lay trenches. That's when the trenches get built, is when we rebuild the entire distribution uh, infrastructure. And we make it immune to hacking. I know, that's an oxymoron too, immune to hacking. Huh? Yeah. They're talking about your car is going to get hacked. <laughs> a lot of cars are going to be drive by wire. A lot of cars are going to have alternative fuels. Um, cars are going to have more value in them on computers than they have in sheet metal and cast iron. There will be more dollars spent on installing computers in cars than metal. Think about that. And everything's going to be Bluetooth. And it's going to be Wi-Fi. And it's going to be hacked. And somebody's going to shut you down as you're driving down the street. Now, it might be the police officer who's chasing you, or it might be your next door neighbor. You come out, and it's five below outside, and he's hacked into your car, and it won't start. Because last, last year, you did something to his grapevine. I don't know. <laughs> so the technology is is rewarding, it's frightening, and it's just going to go everywhere. And the things that you are going to see, I tell my students, with stem cell research and, and biomimicry coming on stream and, and biosimilars uh, replacing uh, existing drugs, they're going to live to be 100, easily. They're, the majority of them will live to be 100. Right now, a few people live to be 100, but in their case, the majority will live to be 100. They, cut, they get a finger cut off in an accident. They'll be able to grow a new one. End-stage renal disease will be a thing of the past. Nobody will need dialysis anymore. These are the kinds of bioinnovations that are happening now that in our lifetimes, we will see things change in the whole world of health. Right now, there's only two ways to get off of dialysis. One is to get a kidney transplant, and the other is to not get a kidney transplant. So. Ah. It's a handicapped spot. It's a silver Lexus. See, if we had our hacking machines, we could shut it off from here. So.
So, um, yes, key partners. Ah, <laughs> that's a good way of getting rid of half your equity. <laughs> you know, there, there are times and reasons to have a business partner. And if that business partner brings a skill or some knowledge that you don't have that really contributes to the business, then yeah, you need a business partner. Um, if he knows or she knows investors that you don't know, it might be worthwhile to bring that person on if that person has credentials that you need to, to be in front of the venture, in, in front of the investor, or that you need to be in front of your engineering group, or that you need to be in front of the customer. If I were going to start an internet company now, I'd love to have Sergey Brin as my partner. Sergey was one of the founders of Google. Um, oh, by the way, Ross Perot had a chance to buy Microsoft for fifty million dollars. Fifty that that's like how much does Kobe does did Kobe Bryant make in a year? Yeah, I don't know. How much does LeBron make in a year? He could he could have bought Microsoft for God's sake. So yeah, there are there are people that make bad decisions. A good business partner might have said, Whatever you think is fair, Bill. Okay. Yeah, I'll buy it. So lots of things. Key partners are the kinds of companies or individuals that bring something that you don't have. It's not another MBA. It's not another engineering degree, unless it's a specific engineering degree. If you're doing something in biomimicry, then fine. You need somebody who knows how to do biomimicry stuff. So uh, your key partners can bring in key resources. They've, they are symbiotic with each other. So, any last questions? Boy, we've taken up that most of the two hours here. I appreciate that. I appreciate your participation, too. I hope that I've inspired some people with stories of disintermediation and disruption and new things that are coming down the pike. Your smart home. You'll be able to walk up to your door. Your door will be securely locked. And as you touch the, the door handle, it unlocks and lets you in. It recognizes your face and says, welcome home, Bob. You have three new emails. And you say, wait a minute. I already knew that. Why do they call these things phones? A phone is probably the least use I put to this device. It's my texting device. It's my emailing device. It's a timer. I use timers in my classroom all the time for presentations. Uh, it's a ca How many people use this more as a camera than as a phone? Well, why don't we call it a camera? <laughs> because it's more of a camera than a phone uh, on, my, on, my, on my home page. I, oh, I've got, uh, I've got some uh, foreign uh, MDs living in my house with me. I've got a big, big house that I rent bedrooms in. They never know what, what the temperature is. So I put a, a Fahrenheit to Celsius converter on my device. I have internet access on Chrome. I have Gmail, I have a voicemail, I have camera, my photo gallery. I had hundreds of pictures on this thing. A calculator, alarm clock, oh, not just an alarm clock. Uh, where's my timer? Right. My timer has erased itself. Oh, calendar, no, no, it's not calendar. Anyway, I've got my, oh, when I was going to business school, the go-to calculator was the HP 12C. I love that calculator. I still have one on my desk. I still use it every day. And now I have an HP 12C on my device. Go figure. I love that calculator. Twitter, NPR. What? It's a what? Tip, tip, what's that? There's a site for that. Oh, oh, right, how to calculate a tip, right. Wait a minute. You all know how to calculate a tip in Ohio, right? <laughs> tax in, in, in Cleveland is seven three quarters. Tax here in Akron is like seven and a half percent. Double the tax, that's your 15% tip. Anybody can multiply by two. You all learned the twos tables when you were back in grade school. I have NPR, I have Twitter. Ah, oh, man, that's just one page. So, 
things are changing. Oh, by the way, Kodak invented a lot of the basic features that are in our phones nowadays, too. They seriously could have been as big as Apple or Samsung or, or Google. Yeah, the simple the simple menu is an important factor in fast food. It really is, in, including for us. You know, we get presented with, you know, two or three dozen choices. We can't make up our mind. So yeah, that's a big problem. I can't I can't imagine that McDonald has labor cost problems, because none of their kid, their employees are full time. They all put them on a part time basis. They don't pay benefits. Ah. So what happens when they raise the minimum wage to 10 bucks an hour or 12 bucks an hour in California, $15 an hour? What's going to happen with the fast food places? No, they will find a thousand ways to mechanize those processes. They will use robots. They will use highly intelligent machines to do what right now a human needs to do. But you can bet that they will cut their labor force in half when they come out with those kinds of robots. Well, fine. Robots, oh, talk about a disrupting technology. Yeah, we can mow our lawns with robots, we can vacuum our rugs with robots. Wait a minute, we can drive our cars with robots. Wait a minute even further, we don't even need a robot to drive our cars. We're gonna have self-driving cars. In California, it is legal for a self-driving car to use the public roads in the state of California. Yes, you can, you can buy a, well, I don't know if you can buy a self-driving car, but if you get one, you can use it. I don't think they get to drive in the carpool lanes. So motorcycles still have the, the benefit there. All right, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to close this. I, you know, I really enjoyed this. I, the, I like the question and answer period better than the speechifying part. Thank you for participating. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, did not. Oh my God, what was I thinking? My email, the easiest, the easiest email address is robertc at uakron.edu. robertc, the letter C, at uakron.edu. Oh, duh. Okay, that's even better. Not on the cover slide, oddly enough, but you're right. robertc at uakron.edu. There you go. You're on Thank you all for coming.